I'll conclude with Wales, and with an experience I doubt I will ever forget. Towards the end of my year, I had one last goal, to visit the remote whaling village of Lama Lera, whose people subsist on the meat of sperm whales, dolphins, whale sharks, and manta rays. This is the only whaling community in the world that goes after sperm whales by leaping onto their backs with bamboo harpoons. Lemolera is tucked away in a forgotten corner of the Nusatangara group. Follow the string of islands east from Bali, and after several days of transport, you will find yourself in the Alor archipelago. You'll pass graveyards of ships and other wreckage, and the island of Lembata is flanked by massive, brooding volcanoes. Its tropical shores and high cliffs are idyllic, and here is La Malera's beach, its geographic center. Behind the black sand beach, you can see the row of thatched shacks that house their whaling boats. Discarded phalanges and vestigial pelvises litter their beach. Ribs and shoulder blades are mixed in with the boulders. Partial skeletons of orca whales abound. Pectoral fins and giant vertebrae dangle from their boathouses like trophies. Here's an orca skull in mid-decomposition, and its spine blackened by the equatorial sun. The carnage is arranged like modern art. Here are some fragments of sperm whale brain cases, my overwhelmed self for scale. Bamboo scaffolding displays strips of drip-drying blubber, and their door frames are lower jaws. Their fences are whale ribs. Whale death, their interior decor. Their economy is whales. Their religion is whales. They live whales. Lamalarans regard their boats with intense reverence. The individuality and spirit of each family unit or clan is manifest in the countenances on these boats. The bamboo plank at the bow is where the harpooner stands to launch himself upon the back of the whale. The bamboo shafts are armed with immaculately carved, cartoonishly large slate harpoons. Here you see a boat as it is in use. Sperm whales are hunted only during the summer months, and I was there a week before the whaling season began. For the rest of the year, dolphins, pilot whales, orca, whale sharks, and manta rays, anything that's not a sperm whale, are fair game. We had the good fortune of being guests on a dolphin hunt for two days in a row. Every morning, the clans would spend their days in the water in search of something, anything, to supplement their diet of rice. You can see them mounting an outboard motor onto this boat. While the sperm whales are hunted strictly under sail and paddle power, in the dolphin hunt, anything goes. As we head out to the fishing grounds, the harpoon lines are made ready and the harpoon heads are sharpened. Here you have the classic La Malera whaling stance, a Y formed behind the back, feet shoulder width apart, and eyes on the horizon. It turns out that the Savo Sea surrounding La Malera is teeming. Almost immediately we begin to see, out on the horizon, pods of dolphin. We draw closer and closer, herding the pod best we can into a manageable size and formation. With deft maneuvering, this pod of spinner dolphins, who are much faster than our boat, are reeled in. Already the harpooner, or Lama Fa, has made ready the first harpoon. As the harpoon is lowered, you know we are getting closer to striking distance. The man standing behind the Lama Tha is the liaison between him and the helmsman, directing the boat which way to go, when exactly to turn, and where the dolphins are. As the pod is drawn nearer, the Lama Tha crouches down, ready to spring. The dolphins are right at the bow now, and the Lama Tha's assistant is getting excited and the whole pod takes a dive. This is typically how it goes. Sometimes several boats work together to break up a pod into more manageable sizes. The assistant is growing excited here. And the pod dives again. We're upon them once more, closer this time. That poor dolphin is right there. The Lama Fa is ready to strike, but it dies. Try again.
we get close, and they dive again. The pod is more dispersed now. This time, the Lama Laren's mean business. The assistant wants it. He can taste it. But the dolphins have eluded us once again. No more joking around. Here we have three different whaling boats pursuing the same poor pilot whale. This whale is out of breath, exhausted from the chase, just sitting there at the surface. Here you can see the three Lama Fas on collision course with each other as they go after this whale. They are going to spear this pilot whale, or spear each other, trying. And, one Lama Fa strikes, the one in our boat follows suit. For seconds I don't know if he has skewered a pilot whale or a Lama Laren. And then the two Lama Fas surface, unpunctured, and the crews all break into laughter. Our Lama Fa climbs back in, smiling from ear to ear. It was amazing how good-natured they were about the whole thing, given the stakes of the hunt. I mean, they're grocery shopping. We stow the line and head back home. Other clans have had more to show for their day on the water. They would haul up juvenile manta rays, yellow fin tuna, sailfish, this one cut in half to be more portable, and even thresher sharks. The elder men are principally responsible for cutting up the bounty into more manageable parts. The first step is beheading. Processing a single manta would dull several machetes in the process. Here, a child helps haul away the manta's head. One day a clan had landed a subadult manta. I paced its wingspan to be 17 feet, which would weigh in at at least a ton. You can see how big its head was, so large that it had to be divided into several sections to be moved from the shore. These are its gills, my size 16 foot for scale. With a catch as large as this, villagers would be hauling pieces of manta up to their huts for the rest of the day. It was a remarkable balancing act, a family affair. Cetaceans are also part of the catch. This is a spinner dolphin, harpooned directly in its melon. The Lama Larens would unroll strips of their blubber, like peeling back wallpaper. The head and the back once belonged to a dwarf sperm whale. Although its closest living relative is, is the sperm whale itself, you can see how the species has evolved to mimic a shark. As the bounty was being processed, children would run wild, pestering the adults. This child has placed a remora on its chest for this portrait. This boy is using a manta's tail as a whip against the wavelets. Sometimes they would watch the elders with intent curiosity, but mostly they just played. Kids would pile into toy boats and play whale hunter, mimicking and practicing for the day they would be doing what their fathers do on a routine basis, hunt sperm whales. The Lamalera sperm whale hunt is outrageous, unbelievable, and unspeakably dangerous. Using sail and paddle-powered boats, they would get out into open sea and wait, possibly for hours, for the spout of a sperm whale. Upon sighting one, they row furiously to reach the leviathan before it goes down for another hour-long dive. Then the harpooner, the Lama Fa, launches himself from the prow and delivers his harpoon. Sometimes two boats team up against a single whale. The ropes leading from these harpoons attach the boats to the enraged whale, and what follows is what's known as the Lamalera Sleigh Ride, in which the whale charges back and forth in an effort to free himself of the dead weight of the boats. The mayhem lasts for hours, until the whale finally exhausts itself. Then the men pull up alongside it and begin stabbing the whale to death. After the whale expires, they attach more lines and haul their 60-ton catch back to the village. This can take all day. When the whale is finally hauled ashore, processing it becomes a wild community affair. They take axe and saw to the whale. Other clans offer helping hands. The whale is used thoroughly for a variety of purposes, as one villager explained to me with this diagram. Nothing is wasted but the whale itself. As with the mantos, the next step is hauling the meat back to the village homes. Successfully catching a whale is so rare, and it provides so much food, that the catch inspires wild ecstasy and religious fervor among the people. The whale plays a central role in the religious lives of La Malera, an ostensibly Catholic mission, but this monument here demonstrates how foundational the whale is to the ultimate concern of the village. The priest's garments are dappled with motifs of manta and whale, 
Our last night in the village, the eve of the whaling season, a candlelight vigil was held in remembrance for all those in living memory who had died during the whale hunt. A list of over 20 names were read, dating back to the 1960s. The whale giveth, and the whale taketh away. The next morning, after a service again on the beach, the priests went to each whaling boat and performed a blessing, and a single whaling boat was ceremoniously launched towards the horizon. Another season of precarious, precious battle with the ultimate leviathans of the deep. On his way to the Aru Islands, Wallace wrote these words in his journal. I think how many besides myself have longed to reach these almost fairy realms, and to see with their own eyes the many wonderful and beautiful things which I am daily encountering. Wallace knew how lucky he was to attend Indonesia's marvels, but he also held no illusions about the treasures he was finding. He knew that his museum collections and memoirs, though memorable and fascinating, could never replace seeing with your own eyes. He knew that he was not the first naturalist to visit the Malay Archipelago, and he knew he would not live to see its deepest secrets unveiled. But it did not matter. Reflecting on my time in Indonesia, I am reminded of the saying, Discovery depends on where you're coming from. Discovering it for yourself, and, in the process, discovering a bit about yourself as well. There's always something to learn about the place you're in, whether it's Indonesia, or the Swanee Domain, or studying abroad, or even home. You just have to get out there, and look, and wonder, and let the land change your mind. That is what natural history is all about. So here's to natural history, and here's to the Swanee Natural History Society. May its fellows continue to inspire us to look around, to make an adventure out of education, and to approach every place we go with open eyes and restless feet. Thank you.